Hello and welcome to Bagana for Science. This is Mikhail Nasi, producer and host of the show. Today I have a guest, Joseph Tabayot, activist and writer on all issues of all of Africa. Joseph Tabayot, welcome to Bagana for Science. Thank you, thank you very much, and thanks also for our uh, listeners. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Eritrean government uh, has now come to, clearly to the forefront in this war on Tigray. It has become the main architect in the political and military front. So where do you think is the Eritrean government heading now? Well, uh, it's a long story. <laughs> uh, but if I have, uh, uh, if I am to come up with a short answer, I would say uh, it's heading to a double suicide. Uh, not only of itself, uh, of by itself, I mean Shabia as an organization or the EPLF or the uh, Kurkolizia Isaias regime. Uh, it has been uh, uh, at the top of the helm for about 50 years, uh, starting its, uh, in its liberation days, almost half a century. Now, uh, the suicide that I'm talking about is not only of itself, but also of the Eritrean nation itself. That is the short answer. But a longer version of that one would, uh, would require uh, uh, a further explanation. Here is a metaphor that I have been using uh, in the article that I wrote almost 15 years ago uh, called Romanticizing the or Romanticizing Revolution. I used uh, the parasite host metaphor. When a, when a parasite keeps devouring the insides of its host, devouring the insides of its host, uh, it will never stop and think, uh, you know, I should moderate my appetite because if the host dies, then I will die. It could never think that way. It will keep devouring simply because it's the only way it will survive. It, it, we could say it's wired that way. It's, it is in its DNA. So is Shabia. Shabia is a parasite and the Eritrean body has been its host for 50 years. If we focus on only on the 30 years of the of the uh, so-called uh, independence years, huh? it has been hollowing out the insides of Eritrea voraciously. It's, it's, it's a voracious parasite. It has uh, uh, the economy has been entirely gutted out. The social fabric of Eritrea, religion, tradition, legality, history, and so forth, has been fiercely attacked. It, the social fabric has been entirely tattered. Normal life, as we know, it doesn't exist in Eritrea. Then there is uh, the, the, one of the greatest enemies, so-called enemies, you know, in, in the head of Shabia is the nuclear family. Uh, it uh, competes with the nuclear family for the possession of its kids. So it has been attacking the nuclear family for 30 odd years. Almost all of the families in Eritrea now are uh, have either, you know, uh, sons and, uh, uh, and daughters that have died in the various wars, or the rest have, uh, are uh, wandering in the Eritrean wilderness in the national service, and most of them have already left the country. So you could say that it has been devouring the use of Eritrea, the use of Eritrea in general. This, all of this is being done for the quest is for total control. Total, by total, I mean totalitarian control. It believes that unless it has total control over the population, and especially over the young uh, generation, then it will lose control over Eritrea. Now, the total mobilization that we, uh, that we are seeing today is a continuation of that, of that parasite devouring Eritrea. For example, uh, let, let me focus only on the demography part. In order to fully grasp the nature of this total mobilization, we will have to focus on its demographics as a continuation of what has been going on for the last 24 years. Uh, that is after the border war of 1998 and 2000. The mass exodus of hundreds of thousands of young men and women Nowadays, it's believed to it reach almost a million of them. Huh? Is a result of that uh, of that process. If you look at the Sawa uh, conscription uh, place, you know, in, in Eritrea, 
there has been 34 rounds of conscription in these 30 years. And every year, average, average uh, about 20,000 are conscripted, uh, go through military training in that, in that camp. Now, if you multiply it, you will get 680,000, already 680,000 have been trained and left the, uh, the uh, camp of Sawa. Then they go through the, uh, the indefinite national service. But this is uh, the crux of the matter. More than 680,000 of young men and women have fled the country in that, in that time, in that, uh, 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 during that mass exodus. As most of them are either, the overwhelming majority of them are either deserters, they have deserted the army and the national service, or, course, or entirely conscription evaders, those that have, uh, those have refused even to be conscripted and then fled to Sudan. Previously, it used also to be to Tigray also. Now, here is the, it means that the EDF or the National Service or the army, the Eritrean army, has been unable to retain the overwhelming majority of its uh, uh, recruits. That's why the army now is hollowed out. If you have seen, if you have carefully followed, you know, for example, the Eritrean prisoners, if you have seen the demography of the Eritrean prisoners, you will see its majority rep uh, represented either by underage or teenagers huh, or the, uh, the overage, and now increasingly women. What you don't see over there is the, 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 the most potent part of, the, of, of what should have been the most potent part of the army. The young men between 20 and 40 are, are, are what, uh, what you see missing. Those are the ones that have left the country. This one, by the way, reflects the demography of Eritrea. If you see, if you see uh, in festivals in, in Asmara, for example, you will see it's represented by women, uh, mainly above uh, three, 30 years old, underage kids and old men. This has become the demography of Eritrea in general, and the army reflects that part. As a result of this mass exodus, then we can say, it's not only the army that has been hollowed out of this most potent group, those aged between 20 and 40, but also the nation itself. The nation is all, has lost almost a million young men and women. If they, and if they had been retained inside Eritrea, it means those are the people that could have raised families. So in general, in roughly we could say that about three million or four million people have been lost in Eritrea. That's why it's now only three million people. So you see the trajectory from the beginning that it was, it's going to a double suicide. So uh, because of the, you see that not only uh, the death of, uh, of uh, uh, Sha'biya itself, huh? but also it wants to take out, to, to, to take with it, you know, down the drains, uh, the whole nation itself. So I see this double suicide in the making, in the making. So the Eritrean government has had these numbers for 30 years. You know, mm -hmm. be it in the army in, in particular or the nation in general. If so, how is it possible uh, for the Eritrean government not to see this inevitable end uh, of what it has been headed to? Okay, so uh, how is it that uh, Shabi uh, didn't see, does, uh, doesn't see or didn't see uh, that it's heading towards uh, uh, this double suicide? Well. Uh, one of the things that I talked about on the first was that, you know, it's, uh, uh, it cannot, let me, let me put it in the form of a dilemma. Hmm? On the one hand, uh, the mass exodus has served as a safety valve uh, for, uh, for the Shabia regime, for the Shabia as an organization. It has to keep uh, devouring young men and women if it's going to survive. That's obvious. Again, uh, let me focus on the demographic aspect, only to highlight this phenomena. If it, is, if it was to totally control this young population, eh, then it felt that it needed to do two things. First, it has to win them out of their families as early as possible when they are teenagers, usually 16, 17 years. 
takes them to Sawa, uh, mold them in the shape of, in the shape of Shabia, as they call it in the shape of Tagadalai. Uh, uh, this is an Orwellian experimentation that has been going on for 30 years, one that has totally failed, but nevertheless, Shabia feels the only way it could survive is by molding the nation in the shape of itself. So that so it has to fight against the family. That's why I call it uh, its primary enemy. It considers its primary enemy in Eritrea is a nuclear family. But at the same time, also, it has to take them out of the cities and towns from Eritrea. The reason is, if it leaves them inside the towns and cities in Eritrea, let's take Asmara only, uh, which is about half a million population. Now it, uh, it has entirely gutted out the, that, that uh, the younger population, the younger generation from Asmara. It started by closing the Asmara University precisely because it was afraid that if it leaves the young population inside the cities at a certain point in time, they could rebel, they could rebel. Allah, for example, uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, so especially after the Arab Spring, that was the fear that Shabia had. But that's not, even in the national service, it felt that, for example, let's say out of this uh, almost a million people that have left Eritrea, conservatively, if we, go, if we, if we estimate that two thirds of them, about 650,000 of them uh, were trained uh, inside the camp. If all of those had remained inside Eritrea, forget about the seats, even in the, country, uh, even the, in the countryside as, as uh, uh, as uh, uh, soldiers in the uh, national service, it's clear that at a certain point it would have erupted, it would have imploded. So for Shabia, so in order to remain safe, Shabia needed first to drive them out from uh, the cities and towns of Eritrea. It did that. And then second, it realized also that if it forcibly holds them inside Eritrea, then it could implode. So for 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 Shabia, the twenty thousand or so that were leaving every year uh, Eritrea was a safety valve. It needed the exodus, the mass exodus was necessary for Shabia to survive, because if it had retained those those people, already things would have uh, gone out of control. So so on the one hand then. It has uh, 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 avoided, it has prevented mass rebellion by forcing the most potent group uh, inside Eritrea, the Warsaw generation or the young generation or the 20 to 40 uh, years, uh, by forcing them out of Eritrea. And most of those people are rebellious, the ones that live. That also is an additional, uh, 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 an additional advantage for Shabia. So, the key word is safety valve. This, it was necessary for Shabia to drive the kids out of the towns first in order to prevent an, uh, an implosion inside uh, 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 the cities and towns, especially Asmara. And then second, from out of the national service because they could also, uh, they, they, were, they are armed, you know, if they have, if they conduct a rebellion, that it would be lethal. So, that was so, like, exactly as a parasite, you know, the parasite metaphor comes over here. At that point in time, it cannot think anything else. It cannot think the, the long range consequences of what it is doing. It simply uh, is focused on survival of day to day, on the day to day basis. But that is the one part of the dilemma. The second part of the dilemma is the one that you have mentioned. Even uh, as, as focused as they, uh, as they are on their survival, they couldn't have missed where the demographics is heading. They couldn't have missed the fact that almost 20,000 years they have it, you know, they have it with them. The, the, uh, I mean, the, 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 not only on, the, 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 on the, the impact that it has on the military, but on the general population, the population has been declining. Even Isaias himself, in his latest speech, Ironically, he, he, he said, I remember, that uh, uh, we are not, uh, uh, we don't have, you know, we are not blessed with uh, popul population, you know, which is amazing because he's, he is himself, uh, he, he is the one reason why uh, 
uh, the population is going down in Eritrea. Now, okay, so uh, uh, the, the problem is, why doesn't it realize it? As I said before, at that point in time, it was, even now, it is impossible, even though it has realized it, uh, lately that it has come to a serious, it's facing with a serious problem, especially in this war, you know, when it comes to this war, still, it's going on the, the way it has been going on before. It's doing exactly the same things that drove the young population uh, to flee uh, 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 outside of Eritrea. For example, uh, during those two past years, they have carefully noted uh, that even at the demographics of, uh, even at the stature of the of the army in Eritrea, there is a lot of change. The reason is tens of thousands of Eritreans have already escaped to Sudan in these two years to escape conscription, uh, uh, to, to escape conscription inside Eritrea. And many of those who are already conscripted, you know, precisely because most of the fighting it has been that has been going on around, uh, for example, Humara all the way to Matamma uh, in that area and Omna Hajar in that area, uh, the Eritrean soldiers were at the border. And that was a good opportunity for many Eritreans, for young men, to simply uh, uh, flee to Sudan. Because deep from inside Eritrea, would have many problems to uh, trespass. Uh, but uh, at that age, you know, it's, uh, anyway, what I'm trying to say is that uh, even now, even though, even as it realizes that it is heading towards a disaster, a disaster, it couldn't prevent itself from doing what it has been doing before. So we have exactly the, uh, we go back to the same problem. It knows that, uh, what it is doing, it knows that it is, uh, its army has been hollowed out. It knows that uh, uh, the nation uh, is heading downward. Yet, it, 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 it doesn't see any, kind, any other option. The only way it could survive, even at this point, is by uh, devouring, you know, uh, the young population again. So it cannot stop. It's almost, that's why I call it suicide. There, there, is, not, there is no way for it to stop even as it realizes uh, the end is coming. <laughs> so uh, are you saying that the Eritrean uh, leadership will uh, be, you know, in this cycle of dilemma or is there anything that it's doing to come out of this dilemma? Well, yes, uh, there's always, you know, a, a solution, but it's an odd kind of solution uh, uh, that, uh, as usual, you know, it's... Uh, uh, an abnormal solution that Shabir has, you know, it's a very, uh, in fact, uh, uh, it gives us uh, a window to the to how Shabir uh, functions, you know, it, is, uh, it gives us an insight into its thinking, into its thinking process. Now, for example, if you look at this is, uh, okay, two choices it has, you know, uh, the parasite, you know, keeps devouring uh, its, uh, you know, a let's say a thinking paradise like, like Shavia, huh? uh, the insides of its host, which is the Eritrean nation, then there are two ideas. I cannot stop. It cannot stop precisely because the moment it stops, it will die itself. Because that's how it survives, by devouring the insides of Eritrea. So what could it do uh, to, prove to prevent uh, its eventual death. Well, there are two things. It will seek another host. It will have to jump from that host that it's killing. Then it will have to uh, to, to to go to another host to survive. So that is how Shabia is functioning right now. There are two hosts that it has uh, uh, targeted right now. One is found inside Eritrea. The other is from Ethiopia, Ethiopia itself. Now, how does it do that? Well, if you if you if you, uh, if you, if you uh, have been following me right, I have been focusing on the young generation of Eritrea. That is the main focus, uh, the main victims of Shabia. That have been the main victims of the, of Shabia. Now, it's not, it realizes that there is not that many left anyway inside Eritrea. It will, it will still focus on them. It will it's still devouring them. Huh? So indeed. 
the 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 uh, the devouring process is still going on, but at the same time, it's trying to replace them because it knows that there is only a limited number and they are not enough to be a host themselves. That's why, as I previously mentioned, it's shifting on the weakest part of the population. It's eating the weakest part of the population right now. Which ones are they? The overage, as I told you, you know, the 50, 60, and 65 years old, the younger. Uh, nowadays, uh, the Eritrean army, uh, a, a good chunk of it is made up of uh, child soldiers, even children and uh, uh, underage. And then the woman, uh, the woman that has been to some extent spared up to recent time, uh, are now being uh, forced to enter in large numbers. So what it is doing is, uh, it is the, the it has jumped jumped from the young men and women. Uh, it's, it's still devouring them, but it's also uh, uh, now uh, devouring those uh, population groups that are the weakest part of, of Eritrea. That's one way. It's still towards its death, but it's it only wants to extend its life. It only wants to extend its life that way. But the, the, the most interesting part is, it has found out that this is not enough. Eritrea would collapse facing especially Tigray, the TDF, with, with only with this, uh, uh, with this, uh, uh, with the weakest part of the population uh, making up uh, the overwhelming majority of its army. So what is it trying to do is, it is planning, oh, well, it's doing it, in fact, not planning, huh? Uh, and it's bringing a huge number of armies from Ethiopia huh, as a host now, as a host. So, it's, uh, so, so that it could, uh, it, it depends on them to survive, to extend its life. Almost more than 100,000, I believe now, uh, the last time I heard was uh, so, uh, and some uh, two or three uh, commando uh, divisions, you know. All in all, there are more than 100,000 Ethiopians right now in, uh, in, er in Eritrea replacing. Remember that the gap that, uh, that they are replacing is the gap left by the mass exodus of Eritreans outside. How do you feel that gap? One is bring the, uh, the, the, the children, women, and uh, the old men from Eritrea. The second part is bring anybody else from outside that could get it. There is one thing probably that highlights this phenomena, uh, the Somali case. Remember the Somali case? About 5,000 of Somalis came to be trained in Eritrea, and then they participated inside Tigray. Uh, inside Tigray. They did participate, although they left about after three, ma after three months or so. Remember, why uh, people are still wondering, why did Isaiah say no to the president of uh, Somalia? You know, give me back my, my trained soldiers. And he has said no. The reason is exactly because he was planning this war. He kept them until this war because he wants them also part of the host. They want, he wants them to be part of, of that host structure. So that host structure is now, you see, made up of these different of these different groups. You know, so all that Shabia thinks is now: how do I extend my life? And this is exactly what it is trying to do. Even though, uh, you know, uh, uh, that too is not going to uh, take uh, long last. But Shabia doesn't think that way. He thinks only about now, okay, I will have those, uh, those uh, the young, the older women from Eritrea, and then the Somali, the Amharas, uh, the, the rest of the Ethiopians, and I, those will be my new hosts in order to survive uh, for a few years from now. Yeah. So what is Eritrea doing now in this uh, round of the war, in this latest uh, renewed fighting? Well, uh, if it is, again, we always have to think uh, in terms of the of survival of Shabia, uh, uh, of that organization, the EPLF, or you might call it that liberation, uh, uh, if, you, if you are going to call it uh, through their liberation years. Uh, what are they doing? Okay. They understand now that unless Tigray is vanquished, uh, their arrears are, uh, are uh, probably short. And not only that, probably uh, it will be decided, their fate will be decided 
within this war itself. So there is this fear. So they have decided that one of the, the first thing that they said was, by any means necessary, they will have to reach Makale. Uh, as General Sarkan has uh, gave us some numbers, about three fourths of a million uh, army, uh, uh, about 750,000 of both Ethiopian and Eritrean army, is arrayed against uh, uh, 200 or 200, 250,000 uh, Tigrayan army. Now, all of this was done with one particular. This has to be the end, the end of the Tigray. This has to be there. We have to reach Magale. Only if we reach Magale, will Sha'biya reassure itself of its existence. Forget about Eritrea. Eritrea has never been in their head. They believe that uh, if Sha'biya goes, they don't give a damn about the Eritrea, whether, whether they take Eritrea with them. That was the first one. Now it seems that they are not sure, although they are trying, you know, they have already gone to Shire and they have heard that uh, today uh, uh, there was, they, they, were, they did advance eastwards, huh? uh, Ad Hagarai towards Ad Hagarai. Uh, so they are still hoping to some, to some extent, although they are not sure right now, after uh, three or four uh, major defeats, huh? Uh, they still want to, they are still trying desperately uh, to reach Magale, uh, which I doubt they believe it even themselves right now. The second one that they are trying to do is, uh, if this fails, huh, what Eritrea is trying to do is probably occupy more Tigrayan uh, space. Uh, and then, uh, for, let's say, uh, for some odd reason, uh, there would be some kind of uh, uh, ceasefire. Huh? Uh, and then the, the siege continues as it has been before. So the siege has to continue, that is on the Eritrean side. Even though, even though, the siege itself now has been a double-edged sword for Eritrea, not for Ethiopia. The siege for Ethiopia is good because it could manage, uh, although, well, uh, uh, although it had economic problems, if you look at the demographic uh, shape in Ethiopia, I mean, uh, with 120 million, there is no shortage of men. So that's not the issue with, with, uh, with, uh, with Ethiopia. But Eritrea cannot afford a, a long siege, even against the Gray, a long siege, even a long siege, because precisely at this moment, the, almost the entire Eritrea families wanted to, to send their kids away, away from Eritrea. More Eritreans are leaving the army of, uh, with, uh, uh, by, uh, uh, mass mass exodus, huh? Ra rather than by uh, 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 by uh, casualties. So, if the siege continues, Eritrea also will face a huge problem. Any any kind of peace uh, uh, in between, you know, any kind of I mean, ceasefire in between would be detrimental to Eritrea. The entire use of Eritrea would leave the, would leave the country. So it cannot afford it, uh, although uh, its second choice is, of course, uh, maintaining the siege. The last one is defending the Eritrean territory. Uh, uh, defending the Eritrean territory because that would be the last resort, you know, uh, the last resort. Just dig in in the trenches, huh? uh, put there, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of soldiers, both Amhara, Ethiopian and, uh, and uh, Eritreans, and stay there to defend Eritrea. I'm not sure whether the Ethiopians were, would be willing to do that indefinitely, but that is the last resort that Eritrea has in mind. So what do you think the Eritrean government dreads now most? And what do you think uh, the war, how do you think the war will end? Well, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, there are two main things that the Eritrean uh, government dreads most at this point in time. Uh, one is heavy casualties. If you remember, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, throughout the war, Eritrea has been fighting with uh, the strategy of Eritrea has been how to uh, preserve its army. Yeah, from the very beginning, uh, there was this strategy of uh, putting in the front, you know, uh, the, 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 the armies of the allies. It could be the Amharas, uh, it could be the 
uh, Ethiopian army. Recently, for example, if you have heard carefully, uh, the first five prisoners that were, uh, uh, that were being interviewed in the Afar front, in the Afar front, they would tell you all of them, the Afar were in front. The Afars were in front of us. That was the, all of them, they were saying that. So they followed the same strategy that they had been following before. They put the, 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 the ones, the allies, armies in the front. Once uh, they, they weaken, uh, the, the, the logic is, once they weaken the, the TDF army in that, in that battle, then the Eritreans get in. Up to, up to that battle, though, they, they only provide uh, a cover of heavy armies, covering artillery, uh, tanks, and stuff like that. It didn't work out in the, in the Afar case, precisely because the Afars were smart ones, unlike the Amharas and the, and the uh, Ethiopian army. They realized exactly what is going to happen, and they escaped quickly. They left them you know, exposed. That's why almost five uh, divisions of Eritreans were uh, uh, destroyed uh, in that, uh, in that, uh, uh, in the attempt to reach Magali through, uh, how, uh, however foolish it was, uh, through the Afar front. Anyway, uh, what I'm trying to say is that that has been the modus operandi of Eritrean, uh, uh, the Eritrean army. Because it knows that it doesn't have that many people, uh, that many, you know, uh, uh, for reasons that I have explained before. And precisely because of that, it knows that it cannot afford to take heavy casualties, the way, for example, the, uh, the Amhara forces have, and the Ethiopian forces have been taking. In one battle, 10,000, 20,000 are dead, 5,000 or so are captured, you know. Uh, for Eritrea, two of those kinds of battles would totally destroy the entire army. So that has been its, its uh, now, though, now, though, it feels, uh, uh, realizes that this time around, it cannot escape from fully involving itself. Even though it has, uh, I mean, a huge number of uh, national, uh, of Ethiopians and so forth, it feels that this time around, it has to involve itself if it's gonna save Eritrea, according to the, so that is the number one thing that uh, 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 this government dreads heavy casualty. It cannot take heavy casualty. That's one. The second one is uh, probably much more than the first one is Eritrea is afraid that it could turn out to be a battleground itself. Remember, the, 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 the battles that are going on are, are right there, are right uh, at the border, at the border areas. The Tigrayans have had experience of you know, invaders getting into, into, the, into their uh, uh, to their place, huh? and uh, uh, they have successfully uh, fought them uh, uh, and drove them back, uh, drove them out uh, of Tigray, because there is this cohesive population huh, that feels the existential threat, and they act uh, as one people. But in Eritrea, it's a different story. If certain part, if uh, if TDF uh, succeeds in pushing Eritrea, say for example, uh, through uh, the way it used it, it, it did in the at the, at the, at the border uh, war, uh, let's say to Hombia, that area, the Gash area, or in Sarai, the Kuhain area, or in a Kologzai, the uh, Shimazana area, you know, if it manages to enter the, 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 the fear that the nation would entirely collapse for various reasons. Let me give you quickly uh, some of the reasons. The first one is economic one. It means that the main source of economy for Eritrea right now are the mining companies. Those are the ones that are providing uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Those companies will instantly disappear. They will leave Eritrea. They will pack their uh, whatever it is that they have to pack and leave and leave. The moment they hear that the, uh, the TDF has entered Eritrean territory, that's number one. The second one, I'm still on the, on the economic part, is the tourism aspect, tourism in uh, quotation marks, because there is no such tourism uh, as, um, as the world knows, you know, for foreigners. These are diaspora Eritreans, tens of thousands of them, that has made almost a pilgrimage to go to Eritrea, mainly supporters of the regime, but also the others, you know, that want to visit their families and so forth. Huh? Uh, tens of thousands of them visit Eritrea every year. And this brings with them, with them the much coveted hard currency, 
which is uh, uh, estimated to be hundreds of millions of dollars with them, which the government manipulates. It gets almost two thirds of that hard currency. It only pro uh, provides the one third of the family. So this has been one of the main uh, sources of income for the Eritrean regime. This will also instantly disappear already. The Eritrean, uh, uh, Eritrean tourists or the Eritrean diaspora Eritreans are getting out of Eritrea and uh, none of them would dare now to go to visit Eritrea. That would be another economic consequences. The other one is the border provinces. If you, if you look at the border provinces of Eritrea, Gash, uh, Sarai and uh, Hazomo, the Hazomo area, these are the most fertile areas in, in, uh, in uh, Eritrea. That means if the war is conducted,